Picture the following scene. The countdown hits zero, the rocket shakes, your body is crushed into the seat, and within minutes the entire Earth becomes just a shrinking blue ball in the window. From that moment on, a journey begins that will forever change the body and mind of anyone brave enough to go to Mars. Before getting there, the crew has already gone through years of physical and psychological training. They were handpicked not just for strength, but for their ability to endure isolation, intense routine, and the pressure of knowing that any mistake could be the last. They say goodbye to their families without being sure when, or even if, they'll set foot on Earth again. And it's not drama. Technically, there's a return. But in practice, after everything the body will face, that can be a very different story. After launch and the maneuver that puts the spacecraft on course for Mars, the longest and quietest part of the trip begins. Months inside a metal cylinder in microgravity, crossing deep space. There's no up or down anymore. Everything floats. People, objects, tears, crumbs of food. At first, the sensation of being weightless might even feel fun, but it quickly becomes a brutal challenge for the body. Without gravity, muscles start to weaken. Legs, which are barely used, lose mass quickly. Bones, no longer needing to support weight, grow more fragile, as if the body understands. It doesn't need to spend energy keeping everything reinforced. The heart changes how it works, because blood no longer pools in the legs and shifts more to the upper body. The face puffs up, the veins in the neck become more pronounced, and if nothing is done, each day on the ship is one more step toward a body less prepared for any gravity at all. That's why exercise becomes a matter of survival. Treadmills with harnesses that strap astronauts down, specialized bikes, resistance machines that simulate non-existent weights. Everything is timed. Every day, no excuses. Even so, it's an uneven fight. The human body was made to live in 1G, not in an environment where you practically weigh nothing. Meanwhile, routine tries to keep the crew sane. Wake up, check systems, run medical exams, train, work on scientific experiments, perform spacecraft maintenance, eat, try to relax, sleep. The food is functional, designed to last and take up little space, not to please. There's no window with a different view, no stepping out for a walk to clear your head. The entire ship might be smaller than a single floor of a building. It's always the same walls, the same voices, the same sounds. And as if all that weren't enough, there's an enemy you can't see, feel, or hear. Space radiation. Far from Earth's magnetic field, the crew is much more exposed to high-energy particles from the sun and from beyond the solar system. The spacecraft has some shielding, but it isn't perfect. Fully shielding it would make everything too heavy to launch. When a stronger solar storm is detected, the crew rushes to the so-called radiation shelter, a section of the ship reinforced with more material, sometimes with water tanks around it, because water is a good shield. They stay there, waiting for the worst to pass, knowing that even with protection, space is always silently exacting a price. Accumulated DNA damage, increased cancer risk, and possible impacts on the nervous system. In this scenario, the mind is also pushed to its limits. As the weeks go by, Earth gets smaller and farther away. Communication still exists, but with delay. You can't just call and talk to anyone in real time. Everything is a message sent and received minutes apart. The crew knows that if something goes really wrong, there's no quick rescue, no going home in a matter of hours. They are truly alone between two worlds. Prolonged isolation raises the risk of anxiety, depression, and conflicts among the crew themselves. Small daily irritations can turn into fights, which is why there are strict protocols, psychological monitoring, and a routine designed to keep everyone busy. Even so, it's impossible to completely eliminate the psychological weight of being trapped in a metal tube in the void with no real way out. After months of travel comes the part many engineers consider the most dangerous of the entire mission, arrival at Mars. The spacecraft is traveling at high speed and must break precisely to be captured by the planet's gravity. Unlike Earth, Mars has a very thin atmosphere. It's bad at protecting against radiation, and it's also tricky for landing. Parachutes alone aren't enough, and landing only with engines is risky and demands a lot of fuel. 
Landing on Mars is a millimetrically choreographed sequence. A heat shield to withstand the heat of entry, giant parachutes to reduce speed, and retro rockets to control the final descent. Any error in angle, altitude, or engine ignition timing can destroy years of planning in a few seconds. Every meter the ship drops is pure tension. Now think about the crew's physical condition at that moment. After months in microgravity, their bodies are no longer the same. Mars's gravity is only about one-third of Earth's, but for someone who has spent so long practically weightless, that's already a lot. Muscles are weakened, bones have lost density, balance isn't reliable anymore. Simply stepping out of the spacecraft and taking a few steps on Martian soil can be a challenge. And as we've said in that other video that's showing up in the cards for you now, if Mars's gravity alone is already a difficulty for those who stayed so long in microgravity, returning to Earth's full gravity can be even more cruel. The body would have to readapt to a weight three times greater than Mars's after years of wear and tear. In many cases, that readaptation can be long and painful and, in more extreme scenarios, maybe not fully possible at all. And, as if that weren't enough, setting foot on Mars isn't the end of the problems. It's just the start of a new kind of struggle. The atmosphere is thin, composed largely of carbon dioxide, with temperatures that can plunge to tens of degrees below zero. The soil is full of fine dust that can get into equipment, wear down parts, and cause respiratory issues if it isn't well filtered. To survive, the first bases will likely be built partially buried or in tunnels dug below the surface, using the soil itself as protection against radiation. Water tanks can be used as a living wall to absorb energetic particles. Life support systems need to run 24 hours a day without failure. Power can come from solar panels, always threatened by dust, or from small nuclear reactors, which also bring their own risks. Every resource is limited. Water recycled all the time, air reprocessed, food grown in controlled environments with greenhouses and cultivation modules. Any problem in one of these systems becomes a real emergency. At this point, the crew is no longer just traveling to Mars. They're trying to prove it's possible to live there long enough for the mission to make sense. In the end, a trip to Mars isn't just about crossing space. It's about accepting that your body, your mind, and your entire life will be redefined. It's facing months without gravity, constant radiation, extreme isolation, the risk of a landing that can go wrong, and the very real possibility of never returning home the way you left. Going to Mars is far from as simple as in the movies, and much less so than many enthusiasts imagine. It's not just about going and colonizing the red planet like someone crossing the ocean to a new continent here on Earth. With the technology we have today, a trip to Mars is almost a one-way ticket. And on top of that, there's no guarantee the spacecraft will even make it to its destination. So here's the question. Knowing all this, would you accept a trip to Mars, even at the risk of turning that journey into a one-way passage? Tell us in the comments if you'd take on this mission or if you'd rather keep exploring the red planet from here, from the safety of Earth. Subscribe to the channel and share. Leave your like to help this video reach more people. Thank you, and see you next time.